Raven Paradox. The Raven Paradox, also known as Hempel's Paradox, Hempel's Ravens, or Paradox of Indoor Ornithology, is a paradox arising from the question of what constitutes evidence for a statement. Observing objects that are neither black nor ravens may formally increase the likelihood that all ravens are black even though, intuitively, these observations are unrelated. This problem was proposed by the logician Carl Gustav Hempel in the 1940s to illustrate a contradiction between inductive logic and intuition. Hempel describes the paradox in terms of the hypothesis. By a contraposition, this statement is equivalent to In all circumstances where, two, is true, one, is also true, and likewise, in all circumstances where, two, is false, i.e., if a world is imagined in which something that was not black, yet was a raven, existed, one, is also false. Given a general statement such as all ravens are black, a form of the same statement that refers to a specific observable instance of the general class would typically be considered to constitute evidence for that general statement. For example, is evidence supporting the hypothesis that all ravens are black? The paradox arises when this same process is applied to statement, too. On citing a green apple, one can observe by the same reasoning, this statement is evidence that, too, if something is not black then it is not a raven. But since, as above, this statement is logically equivalent to, 1, all ravens are black, it follows that the sight of a green apple is evidence supporting the notion that all ravens are black. This conclusion seems paradoxical because it implies that information has been gained about ravens by looking at an apple. Nickett's criterion says that only observations of ravens should affect one's view as to whether all ravens are black. Observing more instances of black raven should support the view, observing white or colored ravens should contradict it, and observations of non-ravens should not have any influence. Hampel's equivalence condition states that when a proposition, X, provides evidence in favor of another proposition Y, then X also provides evidence in favor of any proposition that is logically equivalent to Y. Realistically, the set of ravens is finite. The set of non-black things is either infinite or beyond human enumeration. To confirm the statement all ravens air black, it would be necessary to observe all ravens. This is difficult but possible. To confirm the statement all non-black things are non-ravens, it would be necessary to examine all non-black things. This is not possible. Observing a black raven could be considered a finite amount of confirmatory evidence, but observing a non-black non-raven would be an infinitesimal amount of evidence. The paradox shows that Nickett's criterion and Hempel's equivalence condition are not mutually consistent. A resolution to the paradox must reject at least stone out of. A satisfactory resolution should also explain why there naively appears to be a paradox. Solutions that accept the paradoxical conclusion can do this by presenting a proposition that we intuitively know to be false but that is easily confused with, PC, while solutions that reject, EC, or, NC, should present a proposition that we intuitively know to be true but that is easily confused with, EC, or, NC. Although this conclusion of the paradox seems counterintuitive, some approaches accept that observations of, colored, Non-ravens can in fact constitute a valid evidence in support for hypotheses about the universal blackness of ravens. Hampel himself accepted the paradoxical conclusion, arguing that the reason the result appears paradoxical is that we possess prior information without which observation of a non-black non-raven would indeed provide evidence that all ravens are black. He illustrates this with the example of the generalization all sodium salts burn yellow and asks us to consider the observation that occurs when somebody holds a piece of pure ice in a colorless flame that does not turn yellow. One of the most popular proposed resolutions is to accept the conclusion that the observation of a green apple provides evidence that all ravens are black Buddha argue that the amount of confirmation provided is very small, due to the large discrepancy between the number of ravens and the number of non-black objects. According to this resolution, the conclusion appears paradoxical because we intuitively estimate the amount of evidence provided by the observation of a green apple to be zero, when it is in fact non-zero but extremely small. I.J. Good's presentation of this argument in 1960 is perhaps the best known, and variations of the argument have been popular ever since, although it had been presented in 1958 and early forms of the argument appeared as early as 1940. Good's argument involves calculating the weight of evidence provided by the observation of a black raven or a white shoe in favor of the hypothesis that all ravens in a collection of objects are black. 
The weight of evidence is the logarithm of the base factor, which in this case is simply the factor by which the odds of the hypothesis changes when the observation is made. The argument goes as follows. Many of the proponents of this resolution and variants of it have been advocates of Bayesian probability, and it is now commonly called the Bayesian solution, although, as Chihara observes, there is no such thing as the Bayesian solution. There are many different solutions that Bayesians have put forward using Bayesian techniques. Noteworthy approaches using Bayesian techniques include Ehrman, Eels, Gibson, Hoshis and Lindenbaum, Hausen, and Erbach, Mackey, and Hintika, who claims that his approach is more Bayesian than the so-called Bayesian solution of the same paradox. Bayesian approaches that make use of Carnap's theory of inductive inference include Humberg, Marr, and Fiddleson et al. Vron has introduced the term standard Bayesian solution to avoid confusion. Marr accepts the paradoxical conclusion, and refines it. To reach, too, he appeals to Carnap's theory of inductive probability, which is, from the Bayesian point of view, a way of assigning prior probabilities that naturally implements induction. According to Carnap's theory, the posterior probability, formula underscore 16, that an object, formula underscore 17, will have a predicate, formula underscore 18, after the evidence formula underscore 19 has been observed, is where formula underscore 21 is the initial probability that formula underscore 17 has the predicate formula underscore 18, formula underscore 24 is the number of objects that have been examined, according to the available evidence formula underscore 19, formula underscore 26 is the number of examined objects that turned out to have the predicate formula underscore 18, and formula underscore 28 is a constant that measures resistance to generalization. If formula underscore 28 is close to zero, formula underscore 16 will be very close to one after a single observation of an object that turned out to have the predicate formula underscore 18, while if formula underscore 28 is much larger than formula underscore 24, formula underscore 16 will be very close to formula underscore 21 regardless of the fraction of observed objects that had the predicate formula underscore 18. Using this Carnapian approach, Marr identifies a proposition we intuitively, and correctly, know is false, but easily confuse with the paradoxical conclusion. The proposition in question is that observing non ravens tells us about the color of ravens. While this is intuitively false and is also false according to Carnap's theory of induction, observing non ravens, according to that same theory, causes us to reduce our estimate of the total number of ravens, and thereby reduces the estimated number of possible counterexamples to the rule that all ravens are black. Hence, from the Bayesian Carnapian point of view, the observation of a non-raven does not tell us anything about the color of ravens, but it tells us about the prevalence of ravens, and supports all ravens are black by reducing our estimate of the number of ravens that might not be black. Much of the discussion of the paradox in general and the Bayesian approach in particular has centered on the relevance of background knowledge. Surprisingly, Marr shows that, for a large class of possible configurations of background knowledge, the observation of a non black non raven provides exactly the same amount of confirmation as the observation of a black raven. The configurations of background knowledge that he considers are those that are provided via sample proposition namely a proposition that is a conjunction of atomic propositions, each of which ascribes a single predicate to a single individual, with no two atomic propositions involving the same individual. Thus, a proposition of the form A is a black raven and B is a white shoe can be considered a sample proposition by taking black raven and white shoe to be predicates. Mars proof appears to contradict the result of the Bayesian argument, which was that the observation of a non-black non-raven provides much less evidence than the observation of a black raven. The reason is that the background knowledge that good and others use cannot be expressed in the form of a sample proposition, in particular, variants of the standard Bayesian approach often suppose, as good did in the argument quoted above, that the total numbers of ravens, non-black objects and or the total number of objects, are known quantities. Mark comments that, the reason we think there are more non-black things than ravens is because that has been true of the things we have observed to date. Evidence of this kind can be represented by a sample proposition. But, given any sample proposition as background evidence, a non black non raven confirms A just as strongly as a black raven does. Thus, my analysis suggests that this response to the paradox, i.e., the standard Bayesian one, cannot be correct. Fiddleson et al. 
examined the conditions under which the observation of a non-black non-raven provides less evidence than the observation of a black raven. They show that, if formula underscore 17 is an object selected at random, formula underscore 38 is the proposition that the object is black, and formula underscore 39 is the proposition that the object is a raven, then the condition is sufficient for the observation of a non-black non-raven to provide less evidence than the observation of a black raven. Here, a line over a proposition indicates the logical negation of that proposition. This condition does not tell us how large the difference in the evidence provided is, but a later calculation in the same paper shows that the weight of evidence provided by a black raven exceeds that provided by a non-black non-raven by about formula underscore 41. This is equal to the amount of additional information, in bits, if the base of the logarithm is 2, that is provided when a raven of unknown color is discovered to be black, given the hypothesis that not all ravens are black. Fiddleson et al. explain that. The authors point out that their analysis is completely consistent with the supposition that a non-black non-raven provides an extremely small amount of evidence although they do not attempt to prove it. They merely calculate the difference between the amount of evidence that a black raven provides and the amount of evidence that a non-black non-raven provides. Some approaches for resolving the paradox focus on the inductive step. They dispute whether observation of a particular instance, such as one black raven is the kind of evidence that necessarily increases confidence in the general hypothesis, such as that ravens are always black. Good gives an example of background knowledge with respect to which the observation of a black raven decreases the probability that all ravens are black. Good concludes that the white shoe is a red herring, sometimes even a black raven can constitute evidence against the hypothesis that all ravens are black, so the fact that the observation of a white shoe can support it is not surprising and not worth attention. Nickett's criterion is false, according to Good, and so the paradoxical conclusion does not follow. Hempel rejected this as a solution to the paradox, insisting that the proposition C is a raven and is black must be considered by itself and without reference to any other information, and pointing out that it was emphasized in section 5.2b of my article in mind, that the very appearance of paradoxical lead in cases like that of the white she results in part from a failure to observe this maxim. The question that then arises is whether the paradox is to be understood in the context of absolutely no background information, as Hempel suggests, or in the context of the background information that we actually possess regarding ravens and black objects, or with regard to all possible configurations of background information. Good had shown that, for some configurations of background knowledge, Nikod's criterion is false, provided that we are willing to equate inductively support with increase the probability of, see below. The possibility remained that, with respect to our actual configuration of knowledge, which is very different from Good's example, Nikod's criterion might still be true and so we could still reach the paradoxical conclusion. Hempel, on the other hand, insists our background knowledge itself is the red herring, and that we should consider induction with respect to a condition of perfect ignorance. In his proposed resolution, Marr implicitly made use of the fact that the proposition all ravens are black is highly probable when it is highly probable that there are no ravens. Good had used this fact before to respond to Hempel's insistence that Nikod's criterion was to be understood to hold in the absence of background information. This, according to Good, is as close as one can reasonably expect to get to a condition of perfect ignorance, and it appears that Nikod's condition is still false. Mar made Good's argument more precise by using Carnap's theory of induction to formalize the notion that if there is one raven, then it is likely that there are many. Mar's argument considers a universe of exactly two objects, each of which is very unlikely to be a raven, a one in a thousand chance, and reasonably unlikely to be black, a one in ten chance. Using Carnap's formula for induction, he finds that the probability that all ravens are black decreases from 0.9985 to 0.8995 when it is discovered that one of the two objects is a black raven. Mark concludes that not only is the paradoxical conclusion true, but that Nikod's criterion is false in the absence of background knowledge, except for the knowledge that the number of objects in the universe is two and that ravens are less likely than black things. Quine argued that the solution to the paradox lies in the recognition that certain predicates, which he called natural kinds, have a distinguished status with respect to induction. This can be illustrated with Nelson Goodman's example of the predicate GRU. An object is GRU if it is blue before, say, and green afterwards. Clearly, 
We expect objects that were blue before to remain blue afterwards, but we do not expect the objects that were found to be grew before to be blue after, since after they would be green. Quine's explanation is that blue is a natural kind, a privileged predicate we can use for induction, while grew is not a natural kind and using induction with it leads to error. This suggests a resolution to the paradox, Nikod's criterion is true for natural kinds, such as blue and black, but is false for artificially contrived predicates, such as grew or non-raven. The paradox arises, according to this resolution, because we implicitly interpret Nikod's criterion as applying to all predicates when in fact it only applies to natural kinds. Another approach, which favors specific predicates over others, was taken by Hintika. Hintika was motivated to find a Bayesian approach to the paradox that did not make use of knowledge about the relative frequencies of ravens and black things. Arguments concerning relative frequencies, he contends, cannot always account for the perceived irrelevance of evidence consisting of observations of objects of type A for the purposes of learning about objects of type not A. His argument can be illustrated by rephrasing the paradox using predicates other than raven and black. For example, all men are at all is equivalent to all short people are women, and so observing that a randomly selected person is a short woman should provide evidence that all men are tall. Despite the fact that we lack background knowledge to indicate that there are dramatically fewer men than short people, we still find ourselves inclined to reject the conclusion. Hintika's example is, a generalization like no material bodies are infinitely divisible seems to be completely unaffected by questions concerning immaterial entities, independently of what one thinks of the relative frequencies of material and immaterial entities in one's universe of discourse. His solution is to introduce an order into the set of predicates. When the logical system is equipped with this order, it is possible to restrict the scope of a generalization such as all ravens are black so that it applies to ravens only and not to non-black things, since the order privileges ravens over non-black things. As he puts it, some approaches for the resolution of the paradox reject Hempel's equivalence condition. That is, they may not consider evidence supporting the statement all non-black objects are non-ravens to necessarily support logically equivalent statements such as all ravens are black. Scheffler and Goodman took an approach to the paradox that incorporates Karl Popper's view that scientific hypotheses are never really confirmed, only falsified. The approach begins by noting that the observation of a black raven does not prove that all ravens are black but it falsifies the contrary hypothesis, no ravens are black. A non-black non-raven, on the other hand, is consistent with both all ravens are black and with no ravens are black. As the authors put it, Selective confirmation violates the equivalence condition since a black raven selectively confirms all ravens are black but not all non-black things are non-ravens. Scheffler and Goodman's concept of selective confirmation is an example of an interpretation of provides evidence in favor of, which does not coincide with increase the probability of. This must be a general feature of all resolutions that reject the equivalence condition, since logically equivalent propositions must always have the same probability. It is impossible for the observation of a black raven to increase the probability of the proposition all ravens are black without causing exactly the same change to the probability that all non-black things are non-ravens. If an observation inductively supports the former but not the latter, then inductively support must refer to something other than changes in the probabilities of propositions. A possible loophole is to interpret all as nearly all, nearly all ravens are black is not equivalent to nearly all non-black things are non-ravens and these propositions can have very different probabilities. This raises the broader question of the relation of probability theory to inductive reasoning. Karl Popper argued that probability theory alone cannot account for induction. His argument involves splitting a hypothesis, formula underscore 47, into a part that is deductively entailed by the evidence, formula underscore 19, and another part. This can be done in two ways. First, consider the splitting. Where formula underscore 52, formula underscore 53 and formula underscore 54 are probabilistically independent, formula underscore 55 and so on. The condition that is necessary for such a splitting off H and E to be possible is formula underscore 56, that is, that formula underscore 47 is probabilistically supported by formula underscore 19. Popper's observation is that the part, formula underscore 53, of formula underscore 47 that receives support from formula underscore 19 actually follows deductively from formula underscore 19, 
while the part of formula underscore 47 that does not follow deductively from formula underscore 19 receives no support at all from formula underscore 19, that is, formula underscore 66. Second, the splitting separates formula underscore 47 into formula underscore 69, which as Popper says, is the logically strongest part of formula underscore 47, or of the content of formula underscore 47, that follows, deductively from formula underscore 19, and formula underscore 73, which, he says, contains all of formula underscore 47 that goes beyond formula underscore 19. He continues. The orthodox name in Pearson theory of hypothesis testing considers how to decide whether to accept or reject a hypothesis, rather than what probability to assign to the hypothesis. From this point of view, the hypothesis that all ravens are black is not accepted gradually, as its probability increases towards sun when more and more observations are made, but is accepted in a single action as the result of evaluating the data that has already been collected. As Neyman and Pearson put it, According to this approach, it is not necessary to assign any value to the probability of a hypothesis, although one must certainly take into account the probability of the data given the hypothesis, or given a competing hypothesis, when deciding whether to accept or to reject. The acceptance or rejection of a hypothesis carries with it the risk of error. This contrasts with the Bayesian approach, which requires that the hypothesis be assigned a prior probability, which is revised in the light of the observed data to obtain the final probability of the hypothesis. Within the Bayesian framework there is no risk of error since hypotheses are not accepted or rejected, instead they are assigned probabilities. An analysis of the paradox from the orthodox point of view has been performed, and leads to, among other insights, a rejection of the equivalence condition. The following propositions all imply one another, every object is either black or not a raven, every raven is black, and every non-black object is a non-raven. They are therefore, by definition, logically equivalent. However, the three propositions have different domains, the first proposition says something about every object, while the second says something about every raven. The first proposition is the only one whose domain of quantification is unrestricted, all objects, so this is the only one that can be expressed in first-order logic. It is logically equivalent to and also to where formula underscore 91 indicates the material conditional, according to which if formula underscore 52 then formula underscore 53 can be understood to mean formula underscore 53 or formula underscore 95. It has been argued by several authors that material implication does not fully capture the meaning of if formula underscore 52 then formula underscore 53, see the paradoxes of material implication. For every object, formula underscore 98, formula underscore 98 is either black or not a raven is true when there are no ravens. It is because of this that all ravens are black is regarded as true when there are no ravens. Furthermore, the arguments that Good and Marr used to criticize Nikod's criterion, See Good's baby, above, relied on this fact, that all ravens are black is highly probable when it is highly probable that there are no ravens. To say that all ravens are black in the absence of any ravens is an empty statement. It refers to nothing. All ravens are white is equally relevant and true, if this statement is considered to have any truth or relevance. Some approaches to the paradox have sought to find other ways of interpreting if formula underscore 52 then formula underscore 53 and all formula underscore 52 or formula underscore 53, which would eliminate the perceived equivalence between all ravens are black and all non-black things are non-ravens. One such approach involves introducing a many-valued logic according to which if formula underscore 52 then formula underscore 53 has the truth value formula underscore 106 meaning indeterminate or inappropriate when formula underscore 52 is false. In such a system, contraposition is not automatically allowed, if formula underscore 52 then formula underscore 53 is not equivalent to if formula underscore 110 then formula underscore 95. Consequently, all ravens are black is not equivalent to all non-black things are non-ravens. In this system, when contraposition occurs, the modality of the conditional involved changes from the indicative, if that piece of butter has been heated to 32 C then it has melted, to the counterfactual, if that piece of butter had been heated to 32 C then it would have melted. According to this argument, this removes the alleged equivalence that is necessary to conclude that yellow cows can inform us about ravens.
Several commentators have observed that the propositions all ravens are black and all non-black things are non-ravens suggest different procedures for testing the hypotheses. For example Good writes. More recently, it has been suggested that all ravens are black and all non-black things are non-ravens can have different effects when accepted. The argument considers situations in which the total numbers or prevalences of ravens and black objects are unknown, but estimated. When the hypothesis all ravens are black is accepted, according to the argument, the estimated number of black objects increases, while the estimated number of ravens does not change. It can be illustrated by considering the situation of two people who have identical information regarding ravens and black objects, and who have identical estimates of the numbers of ravens and black objects. For concreteness, suppose that there are 100 objects overall, and, according to the information available to the people involved, each object is just as likely to be a non-raven as it is to be a raven, and just as likely to be black as it is to be non-black. And the propositions formula underscore 117 are independent for different objects formula underscore 17, formula underscore 3 and so on. Then the estimated number of ravens is 50. The estimated number of black things is 50, the estimated number of black ravens is 25, and the estimated number of non-black ravens, counterexamples to the hypotheses is 25. If one of the people performs a statistical test, for example an Amon Pearson test or the comparison of the accumulated weight of evidence to a threshold, of the hypothesis that all ravens are black, while the other tests the hypothesis that all non-black objects are non-ravens. For simplicity, Suppose that the evidence used for the test has nothing to do with the collection of 100 objects dealt with here. If the first person accepts the hypothesis that all ravens are black, then, according to the argument, about 50 objects whose colors were previously in doubt the ravens are now thought to be black, while nothing different is thought about the remaining objects, the non ravens. Consequently, he should estimate the number of black ravens at 50, the number of black non-ravens at 25 and the number of non-black non-ravens at 25. By specifying these changes, this argument explicitly restricts the domain of all ravens are black to ravens. On the other hand, if the second person accepts the hypothesis that all non-black objects are non-ravens, then the approximately 50 non-black objects about which it was uncertain whether each was a raven, will be thought to be non-ravens. At the same time, Nothing different will be thought about the approximately 50 remaining objects, the black objects. Consequently, he should estimate the number of black ravens at 25, the number of black non-ravens at 25 and the number of non-black non-ravens at 50. According to this argument, since the two people disagree about their estimates after they have accepted the different hypotheses, accepting all ravens are black is not equivalent to accepting all non-black things are non-ravens, accepting the former means estimating more things to be black while accepting the latter involves estimating more things to be non-ravens. Correspondingly, the argument goes, the former requires as evidence ravens that turn out to be black and the latter requires non-black things that turn out to be non-ravens. A number of authors have argued that propositions of the form all formula underscore 52 or formula underscore 53 presuppose that there are objects that are formula underscore 52. This analysis has been applied to the raven paradox. A modified logic can take account of existential presuppositions using the presuppositional operator, dot for example, can denote all ravens are black while indicating that it is ravens and not non-black objects which are presupposed to exist in this example. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.